Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Carrie wright Platias. I am the program head for scientific and technical partnerships in Africa here at IFPRI. And we're thrilled today with the group that has come together, including Governor Ritter and other friends, to join in what we would like to focus on in terms of acknowledging and understanding the water, land, energy, and food are deeply connected. And how can we go about maybe breaking down some silos, creating conversation in a space where maybe we're not doing a lot of cross-sectoral work yet and actually explore that. Uh, we are going to focus on together um, sort of a focus on policy, partnerships, and on scaling new innovations. And how can we come forward with our different research activities, our policy work that's taking place to really uh, convey um, how we can move forward on that together. So I'm gonna start with just introducing our panel and then we're gonna go through each person being able to speak a little bit into their research or their activities and have some conversation amongst the panel together and then go to Q&A both here in the audience and online. So I'll start, <coughs> um, we have Charles North to my left who is the Senior Deputy Assistant Administrator for the USAID's Bureau for Economic Growth, Education and Environment. In looking over what the Bureau does, this is a new partner and new friend to IFPRI and um, the activities are economic growth and trade, infrastructure and engineering, education, environment and global climate change, water, gender equality, and women's empowerment. So <laughs> Charles has his hands full. And um, he actually came to E3 from Russia where he served as the mission director prior and oversaw a $60 million program and has joined USAID in 1987, where he has worked for more than 17 years total in overseas missions, including Kenya, Sudan, Mozambique, El Salvador, and Russia. So we're very pleased to have Charles with us, thank you. To his left, <coughs> we have Claudia Ringler, who is the Deputy Division Director here at IFPRI in the Environment and Production Technology Division. She co-leads the Institute's Water Research Program and is also a co-manager of the Managing Resources Variability and Competing Uses flagship, that is a mouthful, for the CGIR Research Program on Water, Lands, and Ecosystems. Claudia's research focuses on res re water resource management and agricultural natural resources policies for developing countries. Claudia, thank you. To her left is Alain Vidal. Alain joins us from our CGIR corporate headquarters, which is in Montpellier, France, where he is the strategy director ad interim and senior partnerships advisor. Um, Alain's focus in his research earlier and, and current today is on global food, environment, and poverty issues. In 2009, he was appointed to, as the director of the CGIR challenge program on water and food which explored new types of partnerships and institutional capacities, and then continued on to become what is WLE now, which is the CGI Research Program on Water, Land, and Ecosystems, and has merged into different form, but um, continues on today. And his work with the consortium office, actually, is focused on capacity development and partnerships, as well as on communications, and as a special liaison, and I think it's wonderful this year to discuss as we lead and head into Paris and the COP, Alain has quite a role that he's playing for the CGIR as well as for the French government. So thank you for joining us today. To his left, um, our colleague, Siwa Masangi, Senior Research Fellow here also at EPTD at IFPRI. And CWA's research focuses on major socioeconomic and biophysical drivers affecting agricultural production and trade and their impacts on nutrition, poverty, and the environment. CWA manages a research portfolio that includes economic and environmental dimensions of sustainable intensification of agriculture, aquaculture, bioenergy, bioeconomy, as well as climate change on agriculture and climate adaptation. So we have a very rich <laughs> opportunity together to now um, kind of dig into some of the issues that Governor Ritter brought up and the opportunities that we have to how do we translate what's taking place in a domestic situation for the United States and some very uh, thought provoking and leading edge work and then take that into a, a international development opportunities. So I'm gonna turn to Charles and ask that maybe we learn a little bit about the Grand Challenge programs that USAID has going on, as well as maybe some of the work that you feel is really important as we're working to break down the silos and get into some of the opportunities that we have together to work in a research and policy capacity. Okay. Charles. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, every Mark, thanks for the introductions. And, and Governor, it's great to be on the panel with you thank with you. the rest of the, the folks here. Uh, 
so <clears throat> as Carrie's pointed out, I <clears throat> lead a, a large bureau uh, with 14 offices, a uh, number of different sectors. I, I lose track after a while, all the different things we cover. So every day I am concerned about the, the nexus, the interchange, the synergies across all these sectors. Uh, and whether it's looking at this, what we're talking about today in terms of water and food and energy uh, or taking into account climate change or land tenure, uh, all these pieces end up coming together uh, one way or another. And, and frankly, we cannot solve uh, or achieve uh, USAID's mission of ending extreme poverty uh, and building uh, resilient democratic societies unless we can find ways of bringing uh, these sectors together, of breaking down the silos. So this is you know, something I'm con concerned about every day. And we are, uh, so I'm happy to be here today to talk about this particular nexus of uh, energy, water, uh, and agriculture, which I should note is also brings another bureaucratic uh, challenge for us is that agriculture is a separate bureau within <laughs> AID. So uh, we have to find ways to working across yet another uh, unit. Mm. I think the, the, you know, just to back up a little bit in terms of what some of the issues we're facing, the, my understanding is that we're up at about 30% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from the agricultural sector. We see that food prices and fossil fuel prices are, are linked. Uh, for now, uh, maybe not so bad, but we have seen the problems when the uh, price of oil goes up. And we also see projections of 70% uh, of the, uh, excuse me, projected food production will need to increase by 70% by 2050 to ensure that everybody can eat. Well, to get there is going to take uh, a lot. We're going to need significant uh, changes in technology uh, to, to meet those challenges. And so I want to take a, a moment to talk about some of the things we're doing in the area of technology. There are, you know, we understand the problem. We understand uh, that there, we need more water for, uh, for, for agriculture for, to have a successful harvest. We know that if you want to have uh, post-harvest production, uh, value-added uh, processing and so forth, if you want to reduce the post-harvest losses, you need reliable energy sources. So we have taken on the, this concept of grand challenges. And I want to give a couple of ex examples. But first, what is a, a grand challenge? Grand challenges is, the concept is we take a problem. We identify what the problem is. We don't know the answer. And we put it out to the public. And we say, we are looking for the best ideas out there. Uh, and so we then get ideas coming in from all over the world. And usually we're focused on technology, but it doesn't have to be just technology. It could be other innovations. It could be management practices. It could be business models. Uh, it could be other, many other different uh, approaches. You may have been seeing in the, in the newspapers about uh, the, uh, the new attire for uh, people working in Ebola-affected areas. Uh, and one of the winners of that grand challenge, uh, I guess, was uh, her specialty was in making uh, wedding dresses. Uh, and so it, this is the kind of people that would not normally be part of the development community conversation, but we're getting people who really know their, uh, have ideas and know what they need to do to, to achieve some success. So two of these grand challenges, uh, one of them is uh, powering agriculture and energy grand challenge. So the, what we're focusing on there is to accelerate the de development and deployment of clean energy solutions that increase agricultural productivity and value in developing countries. The other one is called the uh, securing water for food grand challenge. And that focuses on the development of innovations that will enable uh, the, food pr the production of food with less water or make water more available, available for production, pro processing, and distribution. Now, before I go on, let me just say we have another innovative approach, uh, not so much in my bureau, but it's the uh, Feed the Futures Innovation Lab. Uh, it's a 
this is focusing on collaborative research on small scale irrigation. This is an effort led by Texas A&M uh, with a number of partners, but I, I should say, note that uh, IFPRI is one of those partners. So I wanted to uh, give a shout out to IFPRI for, for that. So, uh, and the, the, that group is looking at ways to, uh, to identify and develop promising small scale irrigation pr uh, technologies, uh, practices and strategies uh, at the farm level. So, uh, so let me come back to you know, these grand challenges. If we, the interest we get is, is huge. Mm. In the first round of putting out these requests for applications, we received over a thousand applications between the two grand challenges. The last week, we closed on the second round of the Powering Agriculture Grand Challenge, and we have 871 applications for that round. I can tell you my staff are going to be very busy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but where are we learning from all this? Beyond that there are good ideas and good technologies to, that we ought to be looking at, first, the key point for us is partnership. We can't do these, uh, any of this on our own. Certainly, we can't come up with these innovative ideas. This is why we need to partner with the world to identify these uh, opportunities. We also need to be looking with other partners. We, in each of these efforts, we have collaborative work with other donors, uh, whether it's Sweden or Australia or uh, Germany and so forth, to identify, to help fund these uh, activities. We're also working with nonprofit organizations and in some cases, the private sector. The Powering Agriculture Grand Challenge, one of our key partners there is Duke Energy. Uh, so one of the uh, largest energy companies uh, in the United States. So you know, we, they are bringing to bear their resources and their expertise to, right. uh, to this problem. Second is the, we need to ensure that whatever we come out of these grand challenges is commercially viable. And now what I'm, my commercially viable, I'm thinking of they have to be technically sound, they have to be uh, environmentally sound, they have to be economically sound. And, and, uh, and of course, as we were talking earlier, they also have to be culturally sound. They have to be something that the local population can actually adopt. So with the, you get that commercially viable technologies, we are in a much better place to go to scale. With, and if those criteria are not met, we're not going to go anywhere. It may be a nice idea, a uh, nice gizmo, but unless we are there commercially viable technologies, it's not going to work. The, uh, let me give you an example. I see in the Powering Agriculture uh, Grand Challenge, it's not surprising, therefore, that 70% of the applicants came from for-profit uh, organizations. Mm -hmm. So the, the people who realize that there is an opportunity here to take uh, this to scale through uh, the market. In, ex in, uh, in India, let me just give a quick example here. They estimate that $10 billion worth of food is lost per year before it's consumed. One key challenge is unreliable or unavailable uh, grid power in many agricultural uh, parts of the country. So one of Powering Agriculture's innovators, Promethean Power Systems, uh, developed and advanced a, a, a battery uh, that is capable of cooling milk in rural areas using solar or even unreliable grid power. India's largest dairies are now adopting uh, this technology. So there's an example of where this grand challenge is already having an impact in the field. Third, we need to in take advantage of the fact that in the developed world, there are many technologies. And are there opportunities for adapting those technologies to the needs uh, of the developing world? The, uh, we think there's a lot of opportunity here, and we have, just give me a, a one uh, great example, uh, and you'll hear why, um, I think it's particularly great, uh, is one of our powering agriculture innovators is Rebound Technology. Uh, which was a spin-off from Colorado State University. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are working to adapt 
uh, let's see if I can get this right. I had to think it through a bit. But molten salt technology. I got that? Okay. Molten salt technology, which is used in large-scale solar uh, power generation. And it's used for keeping the, you know, the heat and so forth. I'm not a technician, but in order to uh, maintain the heat when the sun goes down and so forth. Well, they're taking this and they're adapting it to the needs of farmers in developing countries so they can cool their crops after harvest. So they preserve them and uh, reduce uh, the post-harvest losses. And I guess the other thing I should know is not just that they are a, a spinoff from uh, CSU, but one of their partners uh, is the Energy Institute at CSU. Yeah. So, uh, so we, we thank you for your support, Governor, on, on this uh, effort. Finally, let me just say that what we need to do in terms of uh, the finding this nexus is for, for us uh, within AID and obviously anybody else, is to take these technologies and build them into our ongoing programs wherever they are. So we, we have been doing this. Uh, we have a ways to go yet in taking the technology to make sure our field staff around the world know about them and know to include them. Uh, but in, in Nepal, we're supporting a market development program uh, for solar pumping uh, as part of our Feed the Future program. In Pakistan, we're working on commercial, uh, commercial scale biogas uh, to improve the design uh, of designs for milk chilling. Uh, <clears throat> and that's import, in part of our dairy development program. And in Benin and Tanzania, as part of the Feed the Future programs, we're using solar dryers to preserve food and reduce post-harvest waste. So there's just some examples of how we're applying uh, innovative technology, innovative approaches to address the, the issues of this nexus of energy, water, uh, and agriculture. Thank you, Charles. Thank you very much.